Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So in this video, I want to go through a question that I got from Martin Little, one of my email subscribers. And Martin says, I have a dedicated space that doubles as my studio and my office for my day job. It is a small room, three by three meters, and has some necessary clutter, such as shelving and a filing cabinet. My goal is to reduce this as much as possible, and most of this lives behind the line of my monitors. But my options are limited. I appreciate that any room treatment helps acoustics, but how does this unavoidable furniture, even things like amps, guitars, basses, etc., that complicates dimensions affect the response of the room? Many thanks for your considerations, Martin. I think this is a really great question, Martin. And it's not actually that easy to answer because obviously rooms are way too unique for me to say this does exactly that. But I'm gonna make an attempt. But before I do that, if you're in the process of treating your home studio, I wanna help you out with my home studio treatment framework, which you can download for free at the link in the description. These are my five steps to treating a room and getting it to translate. It's basically the same process that I teach my students and that I go through myself when I treat home studios. So it's all the things, all the steps that you need to take in order to take your room from untreated to fully treated and actually get a sound from your speakers that you can trust. The usual problem is that there are so many things to think about, so many little details that you question, that you wonder about, that it's really easy to get lost and also just focus your energy on the wrong things at the wrong time. And so with this framework, I wanna give you a kind of step-by-step, top-level perspective, what to focus on at each step of the way of treating your home studio so that you know exactly what you need to focus on next if you are building out your studio. So again, you can download that for free at the link in the description, my home studio treatment framework, my five steps to treating a studio and getting it to translate. But with that, let's get back to this question. So let me start with a big disclaimer, and I just mentioned it, it's quite hard for me to say this does exactly that. So rooms are way too unique for me to make that kind of assessment. And also small rooms with a lot of kind of clutter in them get so complicated so quickly in terms of their response that it's just really hard to pick apart and understand what exactly does what. But let me give you a general guideline to assess the actual impact of furniture and other things in your room. But generally know this, if something actually causes a problem, it's usually pretty obvious. Yeah. So in other words, when you're thinking about this stuff, focus on what you do know and not what you don't know, or rather focus your energy on things that you can do and not things that you can't do. Otherwise you might end up in loops of thinking about things, obsessing about things that probably don't really matter in the big picture. And obviously remember, this is not a life and death situation, okay? The worst thing that can happen is that you can't hear the music properly, yeah? That's literally the worst case scenario, okay? So just let that sink in for a moment. That said, let me walk you through a thought experiment in order for us to figure out the impact that your typical furniture has in the room. And we're gonna start this thought experiment with a completely empty room, okay? So a standard rectangle and well, not even a door and a window in it, literally just a standard rectangular room with just a set of stereo speakers and a chair for us to sit in, AKA for our listening position, or imagine that we have a microphone there, whatever, but it's basically just two speakers and a listening position. And by the way, this is the typical configuration that acousticians will actually measure their rooms in, because even just putting a desk in between the speakers and the listening position will have such a great impact that the response will be completely altered. Yeah? And for anybody who doesn't really understand this and know this, the first thing they'll think is, eh, but this doesn't look all that great. Yeah, The thing is, unless the room is completely empty, literally completely empty, apart from the speakers and potentially the microphone that you're measuring with, you won't be able to get the response, at least in terms of measurements, that we typically strive for and that we typically obsess about so much. So just keep that in mind as we kind of move forward. The, the ideal response that you'd like to have from a room is literally only achievable 
in a completely empty room, aka a room that is basically unusable because it doesn't have any, any equipment or furniture in it. So in a room like that, so our completely empty rectangle, the response will basically be dominated by three main effects, right? So below 150 Hertz roundabout, we have room resonances, standing waves, room modes, whatever you wanna call them that dominate the low end response. We might also have some speaker boundary interference thrown in that is kind of laying on top of that. So that will be a bass boost plus a first dip that usually sits somewhere around kind of 80 to 120 Hertz, something like that. And then above 150 Hertz, the response is dominated by reflections. Those three effects together basically build or make up the frequency response and obviously also the decay of the room. This, re this response will be completely symmetrical because we've set up our speakers symmetrically in the room and the room itself is symmetrical. So now as you start putting furniture in the room, their size, their material makeup and geometry and their position relative to the speakers and the listening position will determine how they affect this response that I just outlined. So the size will determine the affected frequency response. Yeah, you gotta remember that sound waves only see objects that are roughly the size of their wavelength or bigger. Yeah, as a point of reference, a one kilohertz tone has a wavelength of about 30 centimeters, one foot. Yeah, so any object that is about the size of one foot can only affect frequencies of one kilohertz and above. The material makeup and the geometry of that piece of furniture, of that thing, will basically determine whether it mainly reflects or absorbs those affected frequencies. And then the position relative to the speakers and the listening position will determine whether anything that is reflected or not reflected because it gets absorbed whether that actually directly affects the response at the listening position or whether it mainly affects, for example, the reverb time or the kind of late response in the room. So let's start by putting our first piece of furniture in the room. Let's just go with a closet, yeah? A simple heavy closet with doors. Such a closet might have a diameter of maybe three meters, 10 feet, right? So it mainly affects frequencies above about 100 Hertz. That means no matter where you put it in the room, it will to some extent affect the standing wave pattern, but only above 100 Hertz, right? So any room modes, any resonances, standing waves below about 100 Hertz won't actually see this closet and will still only be basically be reflected off of the actual surfaces of the room. So. The closet can affect that those higher room modes and because it actually changes the dimensions in that frequency range of the room, it will most likely shorten any distances and that will actually shift any potential room modes in that range further up in frequency. Now sound waves of frequencies higher than 100 Hertz will also see the closet. So that means that the reflection pattern will change depending on where the closet is located in the room. And typically those sound waves will arrive earlier at the listening position because they now don't reflect off of the wall behind the closet, but actually off of the front of the closet. And that means they, have to, they don't have to travel quite so far. And so they will arrive earlier at the listening position. On top of that, if the closet isn't placed symmetrically in the, in the room, that means that from that side only the reflections will arrive earlier. And that actually means that the response is now no longer symmetrical, which will cause a shift in the stereo image to some extent. And this effect will be similar for any type of furniture of a similar size and material makeup. Now you might be wondering what about if the closet doesn't have any doors or maybe it's made from some really flimsy wood and well, yeah, at that point, this whole thought experiment starts becoming way more difficult, right? Because obviously if the closet doesn't have doors, that energy can actually enter the closet and reflect off of the back wall. If the material isn't as strong, 
some of that energy might actually pass through <laughs> the, the walls of the closet. The, the, the whole thing could potentially start resonating. Yeah, that's something I'll cover in a bit. But already you can probably tell this is where things start getting complicated. And this is where we're just talking about a single piece of furniture in the room. So the, for the moment, let's just keep thinking about it in terms of a heavy closet with actual doors, just because it makes this thought experiment more easily understandable. Next, let's put a two-person couch in the room. A simple couch made from fabric to make things easy. Yeah. So again, a couch like this will be big enough to affect the higher order room modes, but not the lowest room modes. They, they won't care. Their wavelengths are way too long. They won't properly see the couch. And so the lowest room modes probably won't be affected. But the higher room modes still see that couch. Now they won't be reflected. That energy won't be reflected. It'll actually be absorbed. And that means we don't get a shift in frequency of those room modes, but instead they'll actually be damped. Similarly, higher frequencies will also not be reflected and they will be absorbed. And that will mean that the entire couch actually reduces the reverb time in the room in the affected frequency range. Yeah, shouldn't be a surprise at, at this point. Although again, if that couch is placed asymmetrically in the room, that means that a certain number of reflections that will be absorbed by the couch are actually missing in the response at the listening position. And so a couch like this, if placed asymmetrically in the room, will also contribute to making the response from your speakers less symmetrical, aka giving you a shift in the stereo image to one side or the other. Now, let's put a guitar and a guitar amp in the room on top of the closet and the couch. With a diameter of maybe just over a foot, the guitar itself will potentially only affect frequencies above one kilohertz. But because it's not really placed in the line of sight of the speaker, right? I mean, guitars typically sit in kind of stands on the floor. Its effect will probably be very limited. Yeah, it might, if you, if, even if you take measurements, it might not actually show up. But with the guitar amp, it's a slightly different story. Although it's similar in size, and so again, in terms of just waves, sound waves, seeing this cabinet, it'll be somewhat similar to the guitar, right? I mean, a cabinet what, has a diameter of like maybe one or two feet, yeah, depending on the size. Obviously, there are bigger ones as well. The main thing with a cabinet is that it is meant to resonate. Yeah, It is a loudspeaker box. It is meant to resonate. And that means that energy, sound energy hitting the cabinet can also excite it and make it resonate. Although it's not built to be excited in that way, so it'll probably not do that to the, to the largest extent, but it can potentially resonate. And that will mean that it actually acts as an absorber in a very limited frequency range. Again, not a very good absorber, so the effect will be very limited, but that can potentially happen. And that kind of brings me to the final effect that we need to think about that potential furniture can have. And that is that any kind of cavity or box can resonate. So either by kind of standing waves inside the body itself or literally just the structure itself starting to resonate. So this will typically be kind of closets, filing cabinets, desks, suspended ceilings, that sort of thing. And in terms of the response, how they affect the frequency response and the time response of the room, on one hand, if they resonate, that means that they take away energy from the room, but they can also actually cause sound and add energy back into the room. Now, this should be pretty obvious when it does happen. And obviously, the simple solution will be to just damp that structure somehow by adding some sort of heavy material to it, or ideally just removing the entire thing from the room. Now, the thing here to understand is that all these effects that I just described, they all sit on top of each other in the room, right? They all just mash together into what then constitutes the response at the listening position. Yeah, so if your brain's already on fire a little bit from just imagining those kind of three, four pieces of furniture in the room, just imagine how complicated things get when you've got a, full, a room full of furniture and clutter and stuff. That's why taking measurements in a room full of stuff is very limited in terms of its usefulness. Yeah? You can tell broad things 
But if there's a certain thing in the frequency response, it's basically impossible to say this is what's causing it. There are just so many things happening that are all layered on top of each other that it's basically impossible to say what's going on. Still, I think as a thought exercise, that should be pretty useful. And hopefully that will give you an idea of the effect that unavoidable furniture has in a room. Yeah, but you always start by thinking of the empty room first, and then you gradually add in the furniture, starting with the biggest things first and then moving to the smallest ones, always thinking about their size, their material makeup and geometry, and where they are located in relation to the speakers and the listening position in order to get an idea of how impactful they might actually be. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. As always, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. That's what it's all about. I'll see you in the next video.